It's a funny time of year, don't you think? The world will tell you that Jesus means nothing to them. He's just a man who lived a long time ago and died. And yet, when we look around our world, every time you try to do something or every time an issue comes up, Jesus is always part of that discussion. <coughs> Whether it's a discussion about social issues or a discussion about legal issues or a discussion about Western society or whatever it is, it always, somehow it comes back to Jesus being either the cause or the solution or something, but Jesus is always in it. It's a funny story because there was nothing religious about the crucifixion of Jesus. If you look over there, we have a nice rugged old piece of cross. Even then it's prettier than it probably was. Jesus was dragged down into the depths of the worst of our society, worst of our world. As the powers and authorities that be in our world decided that for whatever reason, some political, some religious, some financial, that this man had to go. Oh, and they were so wise, wise in their own eyes, not seeing that behind the scenes God was orchestrating it all. We live in a world where people talk about, uh, I don't want anybody to tell me what to do, I want to do my own thing, and almost all of those people end up in prison where they tell them what to do all the time, every day of their life. And whether you end up in a real prison or a prison of your own making, the realities are the same, that mankind left to do his own thing always ends up in the same place. And so we have this glorious story of, of the man, the God-man. Human but God. Who came willingly into a world to live among his people and to share with them the intimate truths about who God really was. Do you ever read those stories? Through the Gospels about what he lived like, what he thought like, what he talked like? If Jesus walked in here today, he'd probably say to a lot of us, boy, you people are sure religious for followers of me. It was no surprise to Jesus what was going to happen to him. He told his disciples many times, he says, I will be taken away by the scribes and the religious leaders and I will be killed and I will rise again the third day. But like us, they didn't hear what he had to say. They, they looked past, they spiritualized it, they missed the message, right? And so when the day came that Jesus was arrested and hauled away, there, what's going on? This isn't the way we envisioned it happening. Just like us, we became Christians. Someone introduced us to Jesus. They prayed a prayer with us. They talked to us about how Jesus had died for our sins. And we thought our life was going to be different. And it is, and it was different, but somehow we missed how different it was supposed to be. And so we became discouraged and we said, man, where did I go wrong? We're going to start our story a little bit before the resurrection story. We're going to start with a brief passage in Luke 16. And there are Bibles around there for those who would like them. Luke 16, starting at verse 13, and Jesus is speaking, and he says, No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, 
heard all these things, that they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed above men is abomination in the sight of God. And the law and the prophets were until John, and since that time the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presses into it. A change had come. God wasn't interested in outward manifestations. God was interested in inward actions and desires. The day of the law and the prophet was coming to an end. And from now on the kingdom would be preached. And John began to preach it. Well, the message of John was, get ready. <laughs> there was a man once who was a pastor of a church and he was preaching. And, and as he was preaching, he was preaching on the return of the Lord. And uh, he was preaching quite, behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. And for emphasis, you know, he was moving around the platform with great an animation and power and conviction. And as he said it the last time, Behold, I come quickly. He fell off the edge of the platform and landed on a lady's lap in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. And he said, Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm sorry, ma'am. And she said, Hey, don't be sorry. You warned me three times. <laughs> and it's a funny story, but the reality is it, our, what we're talking about today is that we should have been prepared. Right? <laughs> We should have been prepared because from the time of John on, the message started to go forth. There's a wind of change blowing in the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom was the thing that God was going to be sharing and preaching to his people. It's interesting that as we come into the new covenant, people want to adopt the old covenant. Right? We are just people who are just addicted to religion. We just can't seem to, to, to quit. You know, we're going to get the people printing up the scorecard sheet for you all so that every Sunday when you come, you can have your scorecard sheet for religiosity, right? You know, dress codes, um, you know, the way people dress, what kind of language comes out of their mouth, you know, all that kind of stuff. How many times they say hallelujah in the service, you know. We, you know and, and Jesus came to set us free from that. Now, we're not going to go through the whole story of the death and resurrection of Jesus, but we're just going to touch on some key points. We're going to pick it up again in John chapter 19 at verse 23. We know how often we talked last week a little bit about the crucifixion. We talked about how awkward and uncomfortable and how demeaning and how painful it was designed to be. It was designed that way for a purpose and Jesus was willing to go and suffer the worst man could throw at him for us. Right? And in John 19, verse 23, it says, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. John 19, verse 24 now. And they said, therefore, among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now, it's, it's phenomenal to understand that the plan of God is unfolding exactly as God planned it. Okay? For those of you who have difficulties living in a modern world where everybody derides and, and tries to criticize the gospel and the message of the Bible and all those things, you don't have to worry about it. Okay? God's timeline is exactly right. He's fulfilling the prophecies exactly as He said He would. They can believe or not believe as they choose to do. It doesn't change anything. There were people from the beginning of time, as the Bible says, there were scoffers always. Okay? You, there's nothing you can do about that. In our world today, we call them, you know, if you have a Facebook page or an online page, they're called haters. The haters. The haters are out there. They're miserable. They're unhappy. They have found a fulfillment, and they take it out on you. 
Okay? And so as the story unfolds, these soldiers, without meaning to, without knowing at all, were fulfilling the exact prophecy of God. I can just imagine Jesus hanging there, looking down and going, yep, another one checked off the list. Right? Another prophecy fulfilled. Oh, that they had read the prophecies and understood what I was trying to say to them. In verse 25 it says, And now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. And then saith he to his, the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own house. I want you to think about it. You have the creator of all things dying on the cross. Infinite power to do whatever he wants. At the speaking of his word, the planets and the universe came into being. And there he hangs. And he looks out there and he sees his earthly mother. And he's not caught up with what's happening to him. He's caught up in what's happening to them. You know, we have things that happen in our life. And, you know, when we read in the Bible, it talks about, you know, giving in secret and praying in secret and fasting in secret, right? So that the Lord who sees in secret will reward you openly. But, it's, but instead we come into the meeting and, and we're, you know, we, our, our lay limp becomes a lot more pronounced when we come into church. <laughs> right? Oh, please notice. Please, please notice and help me to my chair, please. Right? And, and there is this thing in us that desires attention. That desires pampering. We all love to be pampered, right? Oh, can you change the channel for me? Oh, we'll just use the remote. Oh, well, I'd have to get up to get the remote. <laughs> Could you do that for me? You're up there anyway. Right? The Bible talks about an honor preferring one another, and and in the church we we just don't get it. And then we wonder we wonder why the world just doesn't flock to this place. And I want you to think about it for a moment because because Jesus talked about if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. Jesus is in the drawing business. He is the message. And after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. And now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. And when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head, and he gave up the ghost. So tell me, once again, what is it you're struggling with today? Because I'm pretty sure I heard him just say that he was on the cross there and said, it's finished. Oh God, I need you to do something more in my life. I know, you know it's, it's finished. You just need to start walking in his leading and promptings. It says in the other passage, it says that the, the veil in the Holy of Holies was ripped from the top to the bottom. Not the bottom to the top. The top to the bottom. God grabbed a hold of that thing and he tore it in half. And he said, that's the end of that. Now, if God said it's the end of that, what in the world are we still being so religious about? What are you still doing? You're bowing and you're curtsying and you're things. You know what I'm talking about? God said, it's done. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's finished. Are you excited about that? Okay. Now, I just have this sort of sneaking suspicion that 
if God, when he speaks to us by his spirit, I don't know, I don't know, but you think that the God who made the universe, when he speaks to us, he might be culturally aware? Anybody think that that might be true? So, so when we do things that are totally culturally obtuse, do you think that probably wasn't the leading of God? <coughs> What's obtuse mean? Obtuse just means, well, it actually just means big and noticeable, but um, in this case it means insensitive. When God spoke that word of prophecy to you, I'm pretty sure he didn't speak it in King James English. <laughs> As he knows, you don't speak King James English. <laughs> right? You might read King James Bible, but, but I don't hear most of you walking around talking to me when you're just talking to me about something in King James English. And so when Jesus said it's finished, he meant it's finished. It's, he meant that we're going to walk with him. He wants us to be real people who are part of the new deal, the new thing. The world is hungry and thirsting for the truth. And so in John chapter 20, we pick up the story. I read somewhere that somebody would say, well, you know, you shouldn't have these sunrise services because that was a pagan thing. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, maybe it was a pagan thing, but Mary was kind of excited to see if Jesus, after the Sabbath, she was wanting to go to the sepulcher to see what was going on. She ran there, it says, early in the morning. It was sunrise, man. That was the end of the, the Jewish Sabbath was sunrise, and she was at the sepulcher. So you can call it pagan or whatever you want. It was just an expression of her desire to find out what was going on with Jesus. In John 20, verse 11, it says, But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she weep, or as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. Still could never get anybody to admit who rolled away the stone. Of course, we know that it was the angel of God. And she seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? And she saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. I want you to think about it for a minute. Have you ever been out shopping somewhere and, um, you know, you just maybe at the grocery store or you're just doing stuff and um, <clears throat> right next to you is somebody you really know well, but you don't even notice them there. Have you ever had that happen to you? And you might even say to them, oh, excuse me, I just need to get to the, the, the bacon over there, or I need to get to the butter. Can I, excuse me? You don't even notice them. And you see, I think that's what happened to Mary. Mary was so caught up in trying to understand what happened to Jesus that when she turned around, Jesus was standing there and she didn't know it was Jesus. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said unto her, Mary, wakey, wakey. <laughs> Mary, and she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. And Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and to your God. Expectations are everything. For all Jesus had said, I'm going to be killed and I'm going to rise again, nobody expected it to happen. The amazing part about the story, it wasn't that long ago that Jesus had gone to meet with some of their friends. <coughs> Mary and Martha. If you remember the story, Lazarus had died. And they sent word, Jesus, Lazarus has died, and Jesus took his time getting there. Remember, Jesus never, in all of his life, never traveled more than 200 miles from his home. Okay? 
And Jesus took his time from their perspective getting there. So when he got there, Lazarus had been dead four days. Do you think there was a reason why Lazarus was allowed to be dead four days? This guy wasn't in a trance. This guy had fallen into a deep sleep. This guy was dead. In fact, she said, when he said, open the tomb, and she said, uh, Jesus, he stinks. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. And it says that Lazarus came forth. You see, Jesus had been teaching all along that whatever God says, it is. And so Mary's expectation was the problem. Mary did not expect to see Jesus alive. She expected that she was going to find him stashed behind a tombstone over here, or somebody had ran and hit him, or they buried him somewhere else. And yet there he stood. And so when he stood before her, she didn't even recognize him because her expectation was to look to find a dead Jesus. But there wasn't a dead Jesus. And then this most amazing thing happens when she has this revelation, when he speaks to her that it's the Lord. It says, verse 18, And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. My wife and I were talking about this on the way here in the car. We were talking about, can't you just see it? Mary runs to meet the disciples and she gets there and you can just hear Peter. Yes, Mary, we know you're all emotional and worked up. And yes, we've all gone through a difficult thing. We know, we understand. And yes, we wish Jesus was alive too. We do, we do. See, the message of evangelism is birthed out of the fact that we have seen Jesus alive. We don't go into the world to preach the gospel because we get brownie points. We're not trying to earn something from God. That's not what it's about. It's because when we have seen Jesus alive, all of a sudden we recognize that that person over there who I care about needs to have the solution to the problem. And Jesus is what it is. <coughs> Jesus is the answer. What's the question? But you see, the problem is we've made it religious. We go out and tell people about, oh, the pastor's going to have us go door to door again. I hate that part. I'm not going to that meeting. I'm going to have an excuse why I don't show up. Mary couldn't wait to tell them what she'd seen. Right? We cannot but, the Bible what the disciples said, we cannot but speak the things we have seen and heard. Is that your testimony? That's what the Easter story is about. That Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world. That he was placed in a tomb that he didn't buy. It was another man's tomb. That he went and preached to the captives. That he rose on the third day victorious. And he is now seated on the right hand of the Father, making intercession on our behalf. That's the message. Are people going to believe it? Not everybody. But they don't, the people don't believe anything. We have a, an empty cross and an empty tomb and we have empty grave clothes. And they all speak to hope. The empty cross tells us that Jesus died for our sins. The empty tomb tells us he's risen from the dead. The empty grave clothes tell us he's ascended to the Father. Jesus said in John 14, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. John 14, 1 and 2. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. The good news, you know, all down through the biblical times, there had never been anybody who didn't die with two exceptions. <sighs> right? We have two exceptions. The Bible says, And Enoch walked with God and was not because God took him. That's one. Second one, it says, That Elijah was carried into the heavens in a whirlwind. Right? 
Those are the only two exceptions that I know of. Even Lazarus, poor guy, had to die again. But he was experienced. He was an experienced dyer. He'd done it before. <laughs> Today, whatever wrote a book on here, that's experience. That's right. <laughs> yeah. But the good news is Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. We aren't sitting here moping about the fact that he's not with us because, of course, he is with us. The message, when Jesus first came into the world, what did they call him? Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. There you go. God with us. And Jesus said, and I will never leave you nor forsake you, even till the end of the age. And so since Jesus came into the world as the Emmanuel, the God with us, God has never left us. Jesus walked with us for those years. Then he ascended on high and he sent us the Holy Spirit of God to come and dwell with us, the Comforter. And someday Jesus is coming back to take us to be with the Father. And so shall we ever be with him. Amen. The Easter story is not a religious story. It's a liberating story. It's an exciting story. Man, if the world had stories like this that they could actually tell, they got to make up their superheroes. They always wear tights. <laughs> but it end with Romans 8, 19. Mary didn't expect what God wants us to come every day expecting, that He is alive. Right? Did you know that? When you got this morning and you prayed, God, I need you in my life. God heard your prayer. The problem isn't with God. The problem is you can get, oh, I didn't think He's really going to do anything. But Romans 8, 19 says, For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. That's what God's called us to, be the manifestation of the sons of God. Stop crying about where you are. Stop worrying about how you're going to get through it. And start being what God's called you to be. Right? God already knows where you are. Jesus was willing to come and be born in a stable. Hello. Jesus was willing to die on a cross. He knows what you're going through. He was at, tempted at all points like as we are yet without sin, by the way. And now he's just calling us to be testimonials to the living Christ. Right? It's not about coming to a meeting. You know, I, I don't ever wear any time in Jesus' life, I never heard him invite anybody to a meeting. Did you know that? It says, Jesus went out into the wilderness, and the people came, and so he sat down and he preached to them. <laughs> right? Jesus was at so and so's house, and as they were sitting at a meal, somebody said something, and Jesus preached the message to them, right? It was a, a spontaneous outpouring of the truth of who God was, manifest through living flesh, which was Jesus. And that's what God has called us to do. A spontaneous manifestation of the nature of God out in the world. It's exciting. So when you go to work and your first temptation is to be all mad and upset about whatever, God wants to speak something new to you and He says, you know what, I've got a different plan. Let's go this route today instead of the old route. What is your expectation from God? God says, take me at my word. Speak to the mountain. Believing is enough. Did you know that? Because believing changes everything. If you speak to the mountain and believe in your heart, then you will have whatsoever you say. That's what the Bible says. I'm not telling you to go around confessing a bunch of things. I'm telling you to believe things. Out of the belief we have in God is where these things come from. If God says to you that he's going to lead your friends to the Lord, believe him. Just be faithful to share. If God says he's going to meet your need, believe him. Stop worrying about it. Just be faithful to do the things he's called you to do. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Jesus. If he's gone away, he will come again to take us to be with him. Let's pray.